one of two of us has a terry turnover, and it's not Justin Sandler. <laughs> it's me. Of the two of us, it's me. Oh, it's very. It's from yesterday. I forgot it. Was, You're eating a day old cherry turnover, and it's not Justin Sandler. <laughs> it's really flaky. <laughs> well, surprisingly flaky. I think it gets flakier with time. Good to see you, buddy. How are you doing? We Good we don't do them on Zoom pal. often. This is mm-hmm. great. You look incredibly handsome. You've been working out or something? I have not. Thank you for asking. Okay. You've been working out your brain. You look mm-hmm. like you're, yeah. I have been working out my brain. You look like you're uh-huh. shoving a cherry turnover in your face. So you look you look very fit. Mm-hmm. Fitness oh, cherry turnover in my mouth. <laughs> it is, man. It's got vitamins and minerals. It has what muscles and growing kids crave. <laughs> Nine right. out of ten moms would gladly give their shrieking kid that if they would shut up. <laughs> so oh, we are going to have a discussion mm-hmm. today about a topic you presented to me. Yeah. And I'm guessing we did different styles of research on this. I'm guessing we did, but research indeed happened because I did not know off the top of my head a proper list of all of the non-water floods that have happened over the years. Now, that's what I want to talk about was weird flood events where weird things run into you that aren't water and do varying degrees of damage to the human body. It got a little morbid the more I researched. Did you run into that as well? Yes, it did. So w- when I started researching, I thought, oh, this will be fun. We'll do one of those skits that we do with a barnacles and testicles skit where we're oh, like, oh, I'm dying. But then <laughs> yeah, there was we- a lot of death. Yeah, where we we go in there, and then the more I started researching, I'm like, this isn't funny at all. This <laughs> no. this, this is not and funny. I'm, and I, I'm laughing, but it's nervous laughing. Yeah, I know, right? So I have some addition. You sent me an initial list of the major non water flood events throughout history, and I was like, oh, this is great. I can talk about you know we do the thing that we love. You talk about the history side. I talk about the engineering side. So I'm going to talk about viscosity and all the stuff, and then. I just started thinking more and more about how this stuff works. And it's just, I don't know. I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole. How, how did you do the research initially? And, and what made you, first of all, what made you want to do this? You, surely you watched like a video or something. Like what made you want to talk about this? I didn't watch a video, but I found the video. What happened was I saw a pattern after a while. I had learned about a flood we're going to discuss that was made of molasses in Boston, way back in the day. I read about that when I was a kid. And then I heard about a silly flood that happened in Russia more recently that I'm not going to spoil because this one was brand new to me. And I thought, I wonder how many times people have been deluged by something that isn't water. And so I went and looked and I was like, oh, dang, sure enough, somebody already thought of this. And other people had the question. And there is a YouTuber who made... uh, pretty popular video on the subject. It's like a little animated explainer video. I think his name is Sam Onella. I had not heard of him before. But the video is well-researched. It's pretty dang good. And you know, there are a handful in there. Some of some of those we're going to talk about here. I, I guess we'll probably hit on all of those here. But then I started going down the rabbit hole. And then I started thinking, well, wait, what counts as a flood? Is it just liquid Right. Or are there other substances that could also count as a flood because the behavior is flood-like, the consequences are flood-like, the idea of a massive reservoir of something dangerous Did you steal this idea from me? Because I sent this to you last night. Did we arrive at this because of the, yeah, the Limnick stuff? So okay. No, the Limnick stuff I had never even heard of until you sent me that. But I mean, what what accounts for a non-water flood? We got to define the term, right? And the research took me down that rabbit hole. And that's how I decided we would need to talk about Pompeii. Because really isn't a volcanic eruption in in the style of what happened in Pompeii in the 70s AD in Italy by Naples? Isn't that really a flood? It is. I mean, you get the pyroclastic cloud. I'm never sure I'm saying that quite right. But all that ash and everything else, it's like airborne magma in that yes it's ash but it resolidifies into something so it's hitting your lungs it reduces your ability to move see orient and then it kills people it's kind of a flood yeah and, and i uh i researched one there's some lakes in africa that do this weird thing that we'll talk about well let's just this was your idea and and because of that you get to de- decide the structure all i ask is that you let me nerd out 
a little bit because I have – this is a fascinating topic, and I went so far down the rabbit hole. So how would you like to structure your topic that you've brought to the table? The whole point is for you to nerd out. The next three episodes that I have conceived of that we're going to do are all me sitting around and thinking about things that would be fun to hear you wrestle through. So you nerding out is the point. You just go crazy because it seems like a history topic, but it ain't. I think it's more of a physics topic with a dash of history mixed in. So I'm pretty excited to just put them in front of you and see what happens. But here's how I want to organize it. When I started, I wanted to go from least absurd with potential for comedy to most absurd for potential of comedy. And I had all these like things in my head. I was like, ah, it'd be pretty funny to riff on that one. People in there, moms, like their babies. Oh, gosh. No. No, this isn't as funny as I thought. Right. Oh, crap. And so then I decided last night, this is how I would like to organize it. I would like to go from least consequential to just warm up to the idea, like, ha ha, it made a big mess, hope you had insurance, suckers, <laughs> to, holy crap, the scale of death and destruction from this seemingly silly, absurd fringe event is massive and world-changing for a huge community of people and probably needs to be handled a little bit more delicately, even if it's in the distant past. So I'd like to go least consequential to most. What do you think about that? I love it. Can I actually, given that that's our structure, least consequential to most, I have a proposal for the final flood that we talk about today. And I'm not going to reveal that to you yet, but I, I have something that's potentially going to happen in the future that we need to look out for and it could be the most devastating of all non-water floods ever and can we end the episode on that wait a second did you just do the art of the podcast hook where you get people to listen <laughs> for the whole thing i'm just it seems you, like you weren't even trying and you just did that i found something last night in my research that i was like there's no way this is a thing and if it is a thing why are we not pouring an incredible amount of resources into fixing this right now so Boy, yeah I see what there you do. go okay I like the order. Locked and loaded. Non-water floods. Here we go. Let's do it. The least consequential non-water flood that I could find was the Great Brooklyn Chocolate Chocolate Fudge Fudge Flood. What? Of 1919. I don't know what you call it. I just thought fudge would make it sound cooler. 1919, like the same year as the, uh, isn't that the same year as the molasses flood? Yes, it is. So January of 1919, you've got the Great Molasses Flood of Boston, which is too consequential to put on the front end of this list, even though it sounds funny because things happened and people got hurt. But nobody got hurt in the Great Fudge Factory Chocolate Fudge Swamp Flood <laughs> of 1919. I'm still working on the name. Did you ever, so, did you ever play Candyland? It seems like there was yeah, a fudge, fudge swamp or something like that. Absolutely, it does. Or like yeah. a location in Pilgrim's Progress by John, John Bunyan where Christian gets bogged down and can't figure out what to do next because he's insufferable. So horrible. before you tell me about what happened, because I actually I didn't find this one in my research, um, can, can I just have one little nugget that I throw in here, and that is viscosity? Are you familiar with viscosity? I am because I remember a commercial from the late 80s or early 90s that was for motor oil, and it said that this one kind of motor oil was better because it prevents, it reduces thermal viscosity and prevents engine breakdown. <laughs> you got to buy the Penn's oil or whatever it was. That's when I learned the word, and back then, Google was called books, so I went <laughs> and found a book, and I book Googled the word viscosity. Did and you really? Viscous. Um, I did. I remember learning that. I specifically remember learning the word, but it's going to sound a lot more defini awesome when you say it because this is what you do. So I would love to hear the correct understanding of what viscosity means. Well, basically, it's the resistance of a fluid to shear, if, if I'm getting that right. Define viscosity. And, and as I say it out loud, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, no. Am I, am I getting that right? So the state of being thick, sticky, and semi-fluid in consistency due to internal friction. It has to do with the internal shear stress on fluid. Oh. 
And, and what's what's interesting is um, engineers take whole classes on this stuff. And so there's this class that a lot of engineers take called energy systems. And what you do is you you learn how to move fluid around in pipes. And you learn that a slow sweeping angle on the pipe is better. It requires less energy or less power to pump the fluid through a slow sweeping arc than a like a hard 90 degree turn. It has to do with internal turbulence and friction on the pipes and things like that. And uh, interestingly, uh, I was interviewing way back in, I guess it was 2001 at the University of Alabama. I was interviewing for a an internship position at McKee Foods in Collegedale, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And at McKee Foods, um, they are the fact they're the company that makes Little Debbie snack cakes. Mm-hmm. And it was absolutely the most interesting interview I've ever been in. They, uh, <laughs> you walk in the room and you've got these like snack cake engineers in front of you, and um, they're asking you questions about things you've done and stuff like that. And at some point in the interview, this one guy that's kind of quiet in the corner, he he takes this little piece of paper and he pushes over in front of you, and he says, uh, Mr. Sandlin, um, I, I, I'm excited that you're interested in working with us at McKee Foods. Would you please tell me, and you look down, and you're, like, taking it all in because you're in interview mode, right? There's a huge piping diagram, and then there's got, like, this nozzle that's drizzling cake batter onto this conveyor belt, and you've got, like, motors moving the conveyor belt, and you've got pumps pumping the, the cake batter. He said, Mr. Sandlin, how would you go about finding the correct horsepower required for this pump that's pumping this cake batter. And I looked at that and I was like, whoa, (laughs) that is amazing. And so can I take a run at answering that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. I'd come in on a Sunday when the whole line is shut down. Right. And I go over to the lever that says cake batter horsepower pumper. Yeah. And I would start everything up, just me, right? Nobody knows I'm in there. And then I would set it to a thing, and then I would see how it did. And if it sucked, I'd run back real quick and change it, and then I'd go look again and see if it was better. And I'd do that until it seemed like that's how that cake batter ought to be coming out. Was that your answer? No, but but you bring (sighs) up a really, really good point. How do you know how to do things in the engineering world before it's been done. Yes. So, I, I mean, in, in, I'm, I know that you're smart and you led me into that answer because that's going to factor into these non-water floods. And uh, I interrupted you. I want to hear the end of the interview story, though. Oh, okay. So the thing that happened in this interview was amazing because I just, like, literally walked out of the class where I was sizing this piping diagram. So basically, I, I looked at the guy and I said, well, that's a very interesting question, John, or whatever his name was. I said, well, I would start by measuring the lengths of all the pipes, and I would need to know the diameter of every single piece of piping in the cake batter flow path. I would need to know the different angles and T's and sweeps and the the energy loss factors for each one of these. And I would need to know the the orifice size at the end and the flow rate, of course, and uh, the pressure at which we'd like to pump the cake batter. And and if I was given all that information, and then I just kind of like said, this is the equation I would use, and, you know, it's like Bernoulli systems kind of thing. I, this is the equations I would use. And and then that's how I would pump, you know, I would size the pump. And he goes, very good answer, Mr. Sandlin. I said, thank you very much. And I was thinking to myself, thank the Lord, I just got out of that class. <laughs> and then the next guy goes, um, yeah, okay, well, let's move on to the next question. I said, no, 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 wait, one more thing. John, I would need to know the kinematic viscosity of the cake batter. Okay, now, now we can go on. <laughs> so it was it was like those nerd moments that you live for, right? So it was really interesting because I had never thought about the viscosity of a, a food product mattering, and I think that's going to factor into some of the stuff we do today, right? I see what you did there. It mattered, right? Because matter is different than tears. They're two different things that come out of your eyes, but they both have different viscosity. What? And the point being that everybody in the world knows that this is a thing, whether they saw that motor oil commercial when they were a kid and went and book Googled it or not. Everybody knows that not all the fluids, not even all the fluids your body makes work the same way. They don't. Yeah. And and I never would have thought to associate that with internal friction or I think sheer was the word that you used. That's next level stuff. And 
I know that everywhere there are jillion engineers who are high-fiving because you're speaking their language right now. But intuitively, and I know I use that word a lot when we talk about your field, all of these things check out. You discover pretty early on as a kid experimenting with the world that this fluid moves different than this fluid. At some point, you realize that if you mix together some cornstarch and water, you get a thing that is barely a fluid, and you figure out that, ah, that's the far end of the viscosity spectrum, though you wouldn't use that language. Look how weird it is. If I push hard, I can't get into that semi-fluid, but if I go easy, it just absorbs my hands like quicksand. That's crazy. And then I assume water? Is the least viscous? Is mercury less viscous than water? Mercury is weird. In no, terms of water, how that is, moves and water is together. not the least viscous. I don't know what it is, but it's not water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, prob- it's yeah. probably something like uh, liquid helium or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, okay, but water has that surface tension factor where you can fill a glass carefully higher than the, the top of the glass. Are we talking about the same thing there? Does viscosity affect surface tension or are these totally different categories? I totally got close. It Helium has a very, very low viscosity. That was a lucky guess. No, no, looks like hydrogen wins. So, yeah, it Good makes job, sense. hydrogen. It's so reliable. It makes really a lot of sense, actually. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, you're, you're taking us to the fudge flood, right? <laughs> I am taking us to the fudge flood, but I'm... I want us to understand the parameters before we get into this. I think it's going to make it more fun for me and everybody. And so my question is, surface tension, is that an expression? Is that relative to viscosity or is that a completely different physical phenomenon? Yeah, it's they're related for sure. Um, they are related. I can't tell you how. But imagine um, it, also temperatures in there too. So imagine a jar of you honey. stole my thing. I stole your thing. That was going to be my next idiot layman observation, but you're right on it. Yeah, that, Temperature, of course, temperature does matter. Tell me more about the surface tension thing. Imagine honey, and we you know, put a fork down into honey, and we pull it out, and you can drizzle the honey off. Now, do the same thing with hot honey. Y- you intuitively know what's going to happen. It's going to behave differently. But now it, do it, the same thing with tap water. What do you mean? Well, I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. So if you go cold water, hot water, either way, that dip, it just doesn't do anything. Yeah. So you can be so far down on the viso- on the viscosity scale that the eye cannot really observe the differences unless they're very dramatic temperature changes. Yes. Whereas something else, 10 degrees with honey is going to change everything about how it moves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and imagine trying to quantify this stuff. Like imagine how would you quantify viscosity? And, and there are ways to do it. You know, you can you can drop a ball, like you can drop a, a sphere into a tube of liquid and watch how long it takes it to drip down. You can mm. put a disc into some liquid and spin the disc huh. and figure out the horsepower it takes to do that. There's a ton of different methods wow. to do that. But the reason this stuff factors into this, what we're talking about, is in these non water floods, when people get in the liquid, it behaves differently. Yes. And and so, you know, we'll see in some of these where people in, end up getting stuck. But t- take me to the happy place. Take me to a happy fudge flood where yeah. where everybody just ate their way out and everyone laughed and Willy Wonka was over like on, on yes. a cliff just laughing in a, in a happy way with everyone. What happened in Brooklyn? My pleasure. There was a company called the Rockwood and Company that made chocolate. I think eventually this company evolved into one that made Tootsie Rolls for a while. I think the Tootsie Roll brand has bounced between a couple of different parent companies. But at this point, they had uh, they had a factory complex that they had built, and the shipping department caught fire one morning, uh, in the very early morning, just after midnight. And as a result, the fire... I uh, got into some chemicals or something else, and there was a big giant explosion. And the building took a whole bunch of abuse. I think the building ended up having to be having to be torn down. And then what happened was the firefighters showed up on the scene to try to combat the thing, and they were like, "What? What the heck actually is this that's oozing out of this building? They don't know what's stored in there." Well, it turns out that it's a mixture of molten chocolate and butter, like ready to go ready to eat, and it would have been in a more viscous state, but 
obviously the the change in temperature liquefied the stuff and butter melts pretty easy and so it just mingled together and flowed down the streets as a chocolate river it filled up the storm drains so water and other pollutants weren't getting into the chocolate it was just a surface layer of chocolate everywhere and the story goes that a whole bunch of kids ran out and started scooping it up with their hands and gobbling it up like greedy little <laughs> 19 teens gremlins who just never, ever, ever got to swim in a chocolate river, ever. And they seized on the opportunity to get to live out that childhood dream, but it didn't last very long. They, they ran off the kids, and they put off the fire, and I don't think they were able to salvage the building. Oh, That's the story. I'm Nobody died. Nobody got hurt. People just ate chocolate out of the street. I'm seeing some, uh, some. I, I just Googled it, and I'm seeing some old ads, or not ads, like, uh, I guess, articles and papers. Gutters run fudge, urchins run miles to chocolate fire. <laughs> I don't know what that means. What is urchins? <laughs> what that means is that somebody was a great writer. That's a that's a headline for the ages. Yeah. <laughs> urchins. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So my question would be um, that the chocolate, was it hot? Like, could it actually hurt people? Because at, at a certain temperature, have you ever got like a hot liquid on you and you're like, ow, 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 and it's not a big deal oh, if yeah. it's, you know, just water and you can wipe it off real quick. But if it's hot glue, oh, my goodness. Have you ever gotten wax or hot glue on your on your hand? Right there. Yes. Every year when I would start to get bored during the candlelight service on Christmas Eve, me and my buddies starting at about age like nine would be like, hmm. How far do you have to let the wax drip from this candle before it hurts when it hits your skin? And so we gradually figured out, like, uh, if you're a couple inches away, that's going to hurt. But if you're 10 inches away and drip it on the back of your other hand, that's just enough time in flight for it to cool to the point where it's mildly uncomfortable but not <laughs> painful. So, yeah, I've done that math. That's amazing. I like that. That's, that's pretty awesome. Sweet. Okay, so that was the 1919. Okay, here's another thing I would like to ask Sweet. on all of these okay. things. I want to know what day of the week each of these floods occurred on. I don't know why that's important to me, but it is important. Yeah. What 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 day was this? Okay, I can solve that right now. Give me a sec. I think the date in this case factors into how everything worked out because nobody had been at the factory if it was a normal work week since Friday. This occurred at one in the morning, just after Sunday wrapped up and just into very, very early Monday morning. Oh, wow. Which seems like it would be a likely time for these kind of events to happen. You've got minimal supervision, and apparently the urchins stayed up real late back then just in case of a fudge flood. So it happened like 1 a.m., well, basically Monday morning at 1 a.m. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay. Cool. I don't know why it's important to me to know the date of the week, but I I just want to know. That's interesting. Perhaps a pattern will emerge. <laughs> Maybe it will. That'd be interesting. This episode of Notable Questions is brought to you by Audible. Audible is uh, an audiobook platform that has expanded into a whole bunch of other things as well. We've been talking about Audible forever because we love it and we use it all the time. Destin, what are you listening to right now? Well, I'm continuing to listen to Backyard Starship, but I want to tell you something else that's going on that Audible has been pivotal in helping me navigate this. So are you familiar with the audiobooks I listened to a while back, The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson? Yeah, I got kids charging through that without me right now. Okay, well, let me just tell you, you're missing out. But I was recently invited to a black tie event which I've never been invited to a black tie event, but it is a release for the wing feather saga. They're doing some type of little thing with wing feather saga. And my son and I, we listen to these audiobooks, And, um, so I just love talking about the kingdom of Anira and Artham P wing feather, the throne warden, Wait a second. the high king. What? Okay. Is this the, is this the story that starts out with a kid laying in bed and there's like a rhyme about a black carriage and a river kind of and like okay yeah i yeah that's what they're listening to all right i've heard this yeah i think my kid did a, a reading for an audition for a play or something so just think, before we go any further you're telling me i should pump the brakes on their progress and jump in with them on this it's amazing dude i mean you, you can let them get out ahead 
that was a little bit fun. So so he was out, you know, there's four stories in the Wing Feather Saga, and he was out ahead of me, and so I would just let him get a little farther ahead of me, and then I would power through the, the audiobooks after, and that way he would be in the driver's seat, and um, I could come back in and say, oh, my goodness, I just got to this part. He's like, I know, Dad. Can you believe uh, this happened? And so yeah. I just let him be in control. And um, so anyway, when I get this this invitation to this black tie thing up in Nashville, I said, well, I've got to take my son. And so I, I asked Tara, I was like, well, I just got invited to this. What do you think? She said, oh, without a doubt, you two need to go. And so we went and we got a little suit picked out. By the way, you can get really what? good deals at Belk. And um, so we, we went and got him, you know, fitted up for his suit and got it tailored and stuff like that. And uh, we're going to go. And it's very exciting. And I'm grateful to Audible for allowing me to power through these audiobooks and have this experience with my son. Yeah, brilliant. What do you listen to right now? My family is using the heck out of our Audible membership right now. We're deep into the Audible Originals expanded catalog uh, they've got just tons of classic stuff that we're into. One of the kids is on War and Peace right now. What? Another is on Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen. Um, I just did Sir Gawain and the Green Knight because I saw that really cool indie film adaptation of that that story last year. That was pretty rad. Uh, Tale of Two Cities, North and South, Crime and Punishment. Canterbury Tales, Wuthering Heights, really? Diary of Anne Frank. That's the stuff that's on my kids' reading, or as it is, listening list for the semester of school. And I just love what my Audible library looks like right now because it's all time-tested, amazing content, and my kids are consuming it. Oh, yeah. It's the same. I'm looking through mine. I've got all kinds of stuff that's, oh, I'm sorry. I've got your audiobook here, Persian Fire. I still need to listen to that. I, I will do that. Worth time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll do that because I want, I'm letting you get out ahead, Matt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Oh, yeah. My goodness. It's all so good. So, what's the, what's the offer sorry. here for the third chair? Um, we could keep gushing, but um, there is an offer here. This isn't a, a sponsored spot. So, so what, how can we bring the third chair into our little Audible world here that we love? I like the way they wrote it down. I'm going to say it their way. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it for free for 30 days. You go to audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500. That's audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days, which, as we just discussed, is now so much more than just the one credit. That alone would be worth it. But what they're doing to give you access to all of this other content has been just fantastic for us. Absolutely. I'm grateful when you, the third chair, uh, consider supporting No Dumb Questions by supporting the sponsor. Uh, in this case, Audible is one of my all-time favorite anything apps or products or however you want to refer to it. it it's genuinely made my life better so if you want to check it out we would love that audible.com slash ndq or text ndq to 500 500 to get audible for free for 30 days do you want to go next no no i don't and, and i think the reason is the stuff that i found was was pr like a lot of people died and so i i think okay. some of mine will be towards the end there's only really two or three that i that I have to bring to the table here. Okay. Uh, man, my next one kills 13 people. That's a few too many. I think we got to go with the <laughs> Pepsi fruit juice flood of Lebian <laughs> Russia next. That is a because... sentence that your brain just put together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. All right. So, all right, uh, homie. April 25th, 2017. You can start looking up what day of the week that is right now because. I'm curious. April 25th. They, so this is recent history, 2017. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know this is it happened. April 25th, 2017. That was a Tuesday. Okay, naturally. Oh, Tuesdays in Russia. I think you know what they say. I don't <laughs> watch for the fruit juice. Watch for the fruit juice explosion. <laughs> this one's pretty straightforward, though the initiating event of the Pepsi fruit juice flood of 2017 of Lebdian Russia, the initiating event is not well known. For some reason, the roof of a warehouse collapsed. That may just be Russian construction. I don't know. But 
it was in the the middle of town. I don't know really anything about this town in terms of its size. Maybe we should know that real quick. Uh, about 20,000 people live in this city. Okay. So not huge. In the middle of town, this warehouse roof caves in, and unfortunately, there were a couple of people in there when it collapsed, but I guess they saw it coming because they only had a couple of minor injuries. They did not die in the collapse, but what happened was you had all of this fruit juice and vegetable juice, some of which apparently was already in consumable form. Other containers were probably meant to be repurposed into a a more popularized or marketable version of the beverage, Mm -hmm. but they just opened up everywhere. And the streets ran red with PepsiCo fruit and vegetable juice. So so hold on. Were these like vats of juice or were they just like a bunch of containers spilled? Okay. It looks like there were varying sizes of containers, but it was a warehouse. So it wasn't a production facility, meaning I don't think they would have had vats. I mean, maybe... Maybe drums would have been the biggest size. I don't have that in front of me, but that's what I seem to recall. So when the collapse happened, effectively, just all of these containers that were ready for shipping or distribution even just got squished and out came everything. 7.4 million gallons is the estimate of how much of this sticky, juicy goo would have flowed. Now, viscosity-wise, what's going to be the difference between your basic popular consumer fruit juice and water i don't know but it's not a lot but what i do know is every time i've ever spilled juice it is sticky and it's a mess and i do not like Mm -hmm. to clean it up and it's like sugar and flies and Mm -hmm. it's not a great deal is was that the deal here no i imagine this would have been like if a billion kids who just ate cheetos and fruit roll-ups and are four years old just went and touched everything Ah. everything I used to have fish tanks. I used to like to keep the fish. And inevitably, our friend's kids would come over and mom would be like, here you go, little Teddy. Why don't you have nine fruit roll-ups? And the kid would eat the fruit roll-ups and he'd have a whole fruit roll-up mustache and his hands would just be covered in fruit roll-up slime. And I'd be like, that kid, he's going to go touch the fish tank (laughs) and he's going to touch the TV. He's going to do it and he's going to touch them a lot. And what do you do? Do you tell this poor young mom who's getting her butt handed to her by the pressures of motherhood, hey, Clean your kid's hands. I don't want them to touch my stuff. Or do you just clean it later? Clean it later. Well, you just clean it later. But wow, (laughs) if it made that big of a mess of my aquarium and my TV, and that probably wasn't 7.4 million gallons on that kid's hands, I just shudder to think how much of a mess this probably made. That's a good point. I wonder if, have you ever left a cup of juice or something out or even like a soft drink? It slowly (laughs) starts to evaporate. And it gets nastier and mm-hmm. nastier. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you get this state that's kind of like fruit roll-up. It's kind of at the bottom of the cup. It's thick. It's nasty. Like a reconstituted grape juice puck? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want to know where that happened? Where? Right here, where you can see me on this Zoom call. Right on the corner of this desk. I did a video a while back where I was like, hey, Christians should try to get along with each other. And... We should even consider taking communion with people who aren't from the same tradition. I was going to put that on the internet, and then everybody was going to be like, yeah, we should get along better. It was going to solve Christianity and and the world. That was my plan with the video. (laughs) Unfortunately, um, it didn't. Did not? It seemed to have made an interesting comment section, but no, no, it turns out a lot of Christians still really disagree with each other about a lot of things, sometimes even angrily. But what I did is I was like, look, here's some communion. And so I had some little communion bread and a thing of grape juice that I went and bought and poured. It was like the ocean spray, yeah. whatever, some cheap brand, but I thought would look good on camera color-wise. So I poured it and I was like, I'm not <laughs> drinking that. And I set it aside right here and I recorded like 200 episodes of my daily podcast. I was like, I got to remember to move that at some point. It started to smell like wine. And then I was like, I don't want to put that in my sink. And I just kept kicking the problem down the road until finally, I kid you not, a few weeks ago, after moving it further and further away from myself, I I eventually had to scrape out the reconstituted grape juice puck. Really? And I'm like, I don't even, as a spiritual analogy, this is now completely ruined in terms of... 
the wine and the bread, and now I understand why other kinds of Christians probably don't want to take communion. <laughs> it's a, at some point, it becomes leaven, too, because of the yeast. It's growing in it. <laughs> yeah, that, too. <laughs> I did eat the bread. So, yeah, I know what you're talking about. We were talking about a non-water flood. So the idea is then if you let this just sit and evaporate, you're going to get that fruit roll-up sludge puck everywhere. Okay. In your whole city, 7.4 million gallons worth. Nobody died from the spill, but here's a recurring theme that we're going to see as we talk about these non-water floods. Every, I mean, there's always a river somewhere, and the concern became, okay, we can spray off the streets, we can clean this up, but we couldn't keep this out of the the river, the Don River, and we're probably going to have gigantic environmental catastrophe when all the fish and Russian alligators, whatever else lives in that water, drinks all of this fruit juice courtesy of Pepsi. But apparently the river just uh, took it like a champ, like a Russian in a slapping contest. <laughs> it just takes it and is like, whatever, give me more, because uh, it was fine and there was no evidence of environmental damage whatsoever. So, you know, thumbs up. Interesting. Okay. All right. So we got the Brooklyn fudge flood. We've got the Pepsi fruit juice flood in Russia in 2017. What is our next one? Mm-hmm. I think it's got to be me again because I'm guessing yours have a lot more. No, a lot of people died yeah. in mine. Now we're just going to go yours. <laughs> Golly. Okay. Uh, the next one up then is going to be the London beer flood. This one's pretty famous. I think a lot of people have heard of this one. It was 17th of October, 1814. Okay. You can look up what day of the week that is if you want. October there. 17th, yeah, 1814. Uh, that's going to be October 17, 1814. That's a Tuesday. Wow. Okay. Another Tuesday. Okay. Look, I'm just going to warn you that there are some racial stereotypes that are going to seem like they're being reinforced by this story. And I do not affirm these. It just, just, this is what happened. <laughs> okay. You've been warned. Okay. Enjoy your discomfort. 17th of October, 1814, you got some kind of incident that occurs chemically inside a giant 22-foot tall wooden vat of beer. Okay. Uh, porter, apparently. It was in the process of fermenting it. Over-fermented, I guess. I don't know how that works, but I think, I think I remember most of the chemical equation for fermentation. So maybe they just drew the part where the expanding CO2, they just drew that in really big letters. And that's what happened. And so then what happened is the, the vat bursts, but the building that is holding it, the Horseshoe Brewery, can't hold it. And the walls give way. It smashes through uh, a brick wall. And the beer, 177 tons of this beer, 388,000 gallons U.S., just explodes out onto the street in this giant wave of partially fermented beer. And so there's there's another wall in the way that gets smashed and the whole thing empties out into the London equivalent of Flea Bottom. The name of this neighborhood is St. Giles, St. Giles Rookery. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you got a bunch of Irish people there. Okay, now look, again, I'm not making any comment about anyone. I'm just reporting what happened here as somebody whose blood runs with the blood of some Irish ancestors as well. I wouldn't want to be self-critical in this way, so I mean nothing by it. There's some Irish people there. They are apparently having a wake, and then they get crushed by a bunch of beer. And what was already a tragic event becomes even tragicer because Eight Tragic. people died oh. in this wave of beer. It's oh. been it's been 208 years as of this recording, so you can't quite laugh about it. Okay. But we can, uh, I mean, but we don't have to be totally serious, I think. 208 years buys you that. What is the age? Well, like, how long this, like, when when is too soon? Like, when can you laugh about things that happen that are ironic? I think it depends. I continue... To remember that time that you and I went to that Who Hot restaurant yes. in Salt Lake City, and you go in there, and they got a little <gasps> Genghis Khan menu for the little youngsters. Right. And it's like, you're little Khan. 
<laughs> like that guy killed millions of people, did horrible things to women and consumed food and beverage out of the skulls of his enemies. He was a master genocider. And you got a little eight year old here with a little con mustache on him. Like I'll have the cookies that I don't know. I, apparently the scale of the atrocity is not it. It's, it's the passage of time because the scale of that atrocity says it's always too soon. That is a very interesting point. Okay, how many people died in the London Beer Flood? The London Beer Flood, you got eight people who died. No joke. Five of them were at an Irish wake for their little boy who had died. Like, no joke, a two-year-old kid had died, and they were, you know, observing the, the, the body and uh, kind of the pre-funeral stuff. And then... Um, and then this flood hits them, and you're like, like, dang, that is... That's bad. Um, yeah. So I mean, so an Irish wake is actually a drink. Um, that That's a cocktail. And <laughs> I didn't know that it doubled as that. It, okay. It does, and uh, it is not beer. It includes, I'm, I'm looking at, let's see, rum, Bacardi. There's some orange juice in there, some other stuff I, I, that I don't know. So apparently that's a drink. That's bad. The non-water flood that killed people. That's the first one on the list that, that people have died. Not happy yeah. about that. No. Yeah, so it was a 15-foot high wave that swept down. Two houses got destroyed. A bunch of other property damage occurred. And uh, do we say the names of the victims we know? Because we actually know who died really? in yes. this S- event. Speak their okay. names. Like it's really sad. A four-year-old girl named Hannah died she was having tea with her mom and another child and she just got i mean just got hit with this wave of beer out of nowhere uh the mother of that two-year-old little boy was one of the mourners who died when that wave hit her Uh, a girl named eleanor cooper she was a uh, 14 year old she died as a result of that as well apparently she got pushed into a bunch of debris and was stuck and buried under there. You got human carnage, obviously, in a way that you kind of want to giggle about because of how absurd it sounds. But just imagine that being the way that you lost a loved one and you tell that story for the rest of your life. How do you even strike that balance of the absurdity of the method of death with the tragedy of losing? I mean, these are all young people. Young people are grieving people. That's everybody who died here. At any rate, the beer ended up in people's basements. It all just ran down there, and uh, people either tried to pump it out or, I mean, they just couldn't get it out, take it out in buckets. I don't know. It's not, it's not good beer when it's half fermented and it's in your basement after running over filthy London streets. There is a bunch of rumors about a bunch of people running out and trying to guzzle it real fast, but... It sounds like that's more just rumor than reality. I think people knew not to drink it. Matt, this is going to shock you a little bit, but I uh, I did research on this as well. What? And um, I've got this uh, this cassette tape here. Oh, yeah. Um, a, a recording of. I'm joking. Well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous. I'm not doing I was that. Like, Dude, <laughs> did you hear all the things I just said and the tone I just struck? Please, <laughs> please, just, please, 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 don't make me barnacles and testicles. <laughs> this incident. I'd rather do Pompeii. Uh, <laughs> if you're uh, if you're new to the No Dumb Questions podcast here, uh, back in the day, uh, <laughs> Matt and I used to. Uh, do these little historical reenactments <laughs> that were absurd and, and the names of the characters were barnacles and testicles. <laughs> but for some reason, um, the fact that you said the names of the victims means we can't do that now. So Nope, we can't, but you told me to do it. Don't know how that works. Yes. <laughs> so All right. that's, what, that's what happened there. This episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon make fantastic earbuds that you can use anywhere, anytime, make them part of your everyday carry, because that's what I do. And you do the same, don't you, Matt? Yeah, this started out as an everyday carry for me. Now two of my kids would call this part of their everyday carry as well. And Camilla's been borrowing mine, but she's getting the rose gold version for Christmas this time around. So it's fun to watch this leak out to a pattern where pretty much anybody in my family can be like, oh, I need earbuds. Anybody have something handy? Mine's in the truck. And 
You know, everybody can just answer, well, am I wearing pants? And in that case, yes, there's always one available. <laughs> well, it, it makes sense that you're giving it to her for Christmas. So they have these holiday bundles this time around. And if you check them out, they've got four that I'm looking at. The Audio Lover, that's Everyday Earbuds plus Everyday Headphones. That's a new product they have. They've got an All-Star Bundle, which is the Everyday plus the Fitness Earbuds. And uh, they also have the Everyday Duo Bundle which is two everyday earbuds, and they have a gaming bundle where you can get gaming earbuds plus gaming headphones. Oh, what's the gaming earbuds? I haven't looked at that yet. Oh, okay. They're, you, get, you get purple. Oh, those purple look good. So, yeah, uh, check out the holiday bundles as well. That's a thing you can do. And, uh, yeah, if you'd like to support the podcast, we'd be grateful. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ. Use the code EARLYBF. It says right here that's 20% off almost any Raycon product, which almost never happens. It's usually just one thing, but this is like anything. Or you can get even bigger savings and get 30% off if you get one of those exclusive holiday bundles that Destin was just talking about. Sweet. That's awesome. Yeah. Again, super grateful that you would consider supporting the podcast by supporting the sponsor. And genuinely, these are good products. You're going to like them. I use them all the time. Agreed. I I think you'll enjoy them. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ. Uh, all right, we got three non-water floods down. You want more or should we just like just be done here? Yeah, let's keep going. That was uh, the second one on a Tuesday. It looks like one of mine has a has a, actually a lower death toll than the, uh, the beer flood. Uh, let's hear about that one then. Okay, so this actually happened in recent history in the nation of Hungary. Um, it was on October 4th, 2000. 10. So this is like not long ago. What was it? October 4th, 2010. Let's see what day of the week that is. Some right. random website says that is a Monday. Uh-huh. All these are happening in the uh, early part of the week, October 4th, 2010. So here's the deal. <clears throat> Imagine that you are a guy named Toldi Tomas, and okay. you, what you've wanted for a long time is to be the mayor of your town of Devesker. No, Devexer. I think that's how you say it. Devex are hungry, okay? Okay. And you finally obtained your goal. You you became the mayor of your town. It's it's only the third mayor since um, you know Hungary is no longer under communist rule. And it's so, a great honor. yeah, that night you just had a big party. You know the the champagne was flowing, everything was going great, and um, you decided, you know what, it is Monday morning. I'm just going to sleep this off a little bit. I'm just going to have a little nap here. I'm going to sleep off my hangover. <clears throat> and then you wake up, your first day as mayor, your phone starts ringing off the hook. And everybody tells you, hey, the dam is broke. And 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 things are happening all over the town. People are getting hurt. You, and, and you're like, what's going on? So... This guy's first day on the job, uh, Toldi Tomas as mayor, was the day that the red toxic mud sludge flood occurred in the town from the neighboring aluminum works plant. So um, there was this this company just up the road. What's so interesting about this, the fact that this happened in 2010, means we had satellites in orbit at this point in time. And you can actually see satellite imagery of this event. So there's this oh. process of m- making aluminum. So what you do is you take bauxite, which is a- an ore. And B-O-X-I-T-E. I, no, I, I think it's B-A-U-X-I-T-E. <clears throat> Wouldn't so, that be boite? I don't know. <laughs> ba- bauxite. Okay, I got it. I'm with you. There's this process to get aluminum from bauxite, and it's called the Bayer process. And a part of the Bayer process is you use, I, I think it's sulfuric acid or something like that, some really, really nasty chemical involving um, sulfur. I, I, th- I think it's H2SO4. You use sulfuric acid and you run it through the bauxite and that pulls the aluminum out. But as it pulls the aluminum out, you also get all this nasty, nasty byproducts that has all kinds of awful stuff in it, like cadmium and heavy metals and they, they call it red mud okay okay so as a an offshoot of this process they have to store the red mud and so this aluminum company just up the road 
um, they have these holding ponds. And they they put all this stuff up there in the holding ponds. Always a great idea, right? Let's just, you know, let's just put all this caustic, nasty stuff uphill from this populated area, right? And so, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? And it's go it's going into the holding ponds to settle out and separate. So this this would be the the process by which you take the worst slurry and you allow however long it takes to separate out pumpable liquid from the the more solid elements then you pump the liquid to another holding pond and it separates again you pump to another holding pond it separates again is it that kind of strategy that old multi-tiered approach i don't know i i don't want to uh i don't want to misspeak but it, i don't know this, this plant i can tell you this it was an alumina plant it was called the ajka alumina plant a-j-k-a and okay. so they're they're doing all this stuff. I, I think the the actual thing they're making is aluminum oxide at this plant, which is interesting. Aluminum oxide, you use it on like hardwood floors, for example. You can use it as a coating. What? Yeah, it's weird. Really? Yeah. So we had some hardwood floors one time coated with aluminum oxide because that gets a nice durable coat. It's a really interesting thing. But anyway, long story but short. But at the most basic level, the point of a holding pond is usually it's a function of time, right? Something needs to happen there and you're not holding it because you want what's in it. You're holding it for the purposes of some kind of separation. It's a temporary phase in a disposal process. Yes. Usually, right? Yes. And, and okay. I'm sitting here looking at a, a breakdown of this red mud that comes out of the, uh, comes out of the, the process. So 40 to 45% of it was iron oxide, which is why it looks like red mud. It, it's it's like rust. Then 10 to 15% was aluminum oxide. It looks like 10 to 15% of it was silicon dioxide. 6 to 10% was calcium oxide. Then you had titanium dioxide, <clears throat> which interestingly, titanium dioxide, you can eat that stuff. That's used in like white cake icing and stuff. And then uh, there's also some... Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. I need to know for sure that wasn't sarcasm. Seriously? Did you eat that? Yeah, yeah. Titanium dioxide is a tasteless additive used to turn your chocolate white icing paste. Yeah, you, you can actually eat titanium dioxide. It's just it's the strangest yeah. thing. I saw bags okay. of it one time and I was like, what? <laughs> but it's a thing. So um, okay, yeah. So all this stuff is in this slurry. On top of that, there's like weird stuff in there that actually makes this red mud radioactive. It's awful, but it, it's very very basic. If I uh, recall correctly like the ph is very basic and so oh, gotcha. um, the ph value of this red mud was 13 which is extremely basic so if this touches your skin it will burn you and like huge sores all over you so imagine you wake up and there's this huge red oh, so man. basically this town in hungary had had a a large uh, a large duration of time where they've getting a lot of rain and so the holding pond like the the mud around the holding pond or the the dirt around the holding pond was starting to move just like very gently. They're like, huh, what's going on? And then all of a sudden the rain stopped. And on this particular day, it was very dry and it was starting to dry out. I don't know if you've ever seen um, after a period of drought, you'll you'll get the the mud starting to shrink and you'll get these cracks. I'm assuming something like that came into play here because just magically, boom the dam broke and this red mud wave just went straight down the streets, took cars, took all kinds of stuff, ran down to the river and it killed uh, 10 people. I think immediately in the initial flow or people trying to get from one place to another and not understanding what kind of liquid they were dealing with. I don't know. And, and being exposed to it. I don't know, but you, you can actually go to the Wikipedia site on this this flood, AJKA, alumina plant accident, and you can see imagery, aerial imagery of it going down from the town. Like the holding pond was pretty far away, but it like ran down the street and just took out everything in its path. It's awful. So it, it looks like it was on the southeast side and from the satellite imagery here, it, it flowed to the northwest, and if if you oh, were to draw, no. if you were to draw I'm this, looking at it. you're like, where would I not want to put a containment pond? Right, of awful stuff. It's right over this town, and that's exactly what they did. Yeah, the only worst place would be like 
in a pool suspended on piers above like an <laughs> elementary school or a nursery. Which is what we're going to get to next. So anyway, this... Why, what? <laughs> yeah, this one was awful. Um, so the, the non-water flood material was, uh, was this red mud stuff. And so it's almost like a landslide, only it's, it's pooled up stuff is awful. Uh, Ten people died. And this was 2010. And again, this happened on a Monday which for some reason matters to me. So everything's okay. happening in the early part of the week here. So, well, And I'm looking at a picture of this right now. It's a picture of a forest, and you can just see it looks like somebody went through and perfectly painted the first four feet, five feet of each tree red to yeah. just exactly the same height. So you can tell by the way the trees, the, the paint line is so perfect you can tell that at this point it had to have been moving very slowly because that staining isn't high on one side of the tree. You can't tell where the flow came from is my point in this photograph. Ah. So even that gives me a little bit of a clue about the viscosity by the time it got here. If it was six feet deep and I can't see a wash line in terms of the splash side of where it was coming from on all of this forest of trees... It means this was oozing yeah. at this level of depth. So much higher viscosity. Yeah. 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 And so if you got caught up in that, you physically wouldn't know what to do. I mean, that's a big part of the danger of quicksand and phenomena like that is it's escapable. It's just counterintuitive because every interaction you've had with fluid that would be deep enough for you to be in over the course of your life would condition you to behave differently than how you would need to behave in quicksand. And so you just get it wrong and you do things that that move you in the wrong direction. It's a psychological killer. I, I think it would be fascinating if, uh, I mean, the odds are so slim, but if there's like a listener that listens to Notum questions, like there's probably five people in Hungary, maybe, if we're lucky. I think it'd be amazing to hear about this from a Hungarian point of view. I think that'd be amazing. So... I don't know. Reach out to us if you're from Hungary and you heard if you heard about this in your in your nation. I think it'd be amazing to hear about that. Anyway, that was the Hungarian uh, red mud flood, the Ajka alumina plant accident. Ten people were killed. About 150 people were seriously injured. It was a pretty big deal. And uh, I encourage you to go look at the satellite imagery from that. What's interesting is you can just go read articles. You just go to Google, find news articles from when this happened. Very interesting. Hmm. Wow, that is a mess that dwarfs the next mess I was going to talk to you about. Okay. I still think I want to touch on this one. Do it. Though it is disappointingly similar to the one you just described. This one happened in the United States on December 22nd, 2008. Can you look up what day? Is this the coal happened? slurry containment pond or something? Wasn't there somewhere? Yeah, that's exactly in, what it is. In West Virginia? You this one up too? No. No, it's in Tennessee. Tennessee. I just remember hearing about this. And so Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Like this was actual news around here. So so what it what is should it? be. It was an incident that was handled by the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yeah. And the TVA has a daily impact on your life given where you live. Yes, absolutely. It's a massive public works environmental management watershed management project dating back to the Great Depression, the 1930s. What? Am, why am I explaining this? The TVA is your lived reality. What is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I can say this. They're, they're a huge hydroelectric um, power. Y you're right. It came about during the Depression. It was one of the, the main things of the New Deal. But all the dams were created up and down the Tennessee River here. And uh, there's a series of locks and stuff like that. So if, if I wanted to get in my kayak and go to the Gulf of Mexico from North Alabama, I first have to go north back into Tennessee and then kick over to the, uh, the Mississippi River and then go down. But I have to go through a series of locks to do that because they control the level of the river. And what's interesting about that is back in school, I get to go to a briefing from one of the engineers that controls the levels of the river. And they said that at every section of the river, because there's so many dams, they have like one thing that they know is the water shall not cross moment. You know, it's like, so 
in the section between Florence and wherever, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, Mrs. Ethel's garden is at this altitude or this, you know, it's 760 feet or whatever it is. Oh. And they're like, oh, you know, we're, we're about 10 foot away from Mrs. Ethel's garden, which is the lowest point on that section of the river where it would affect the local population. And so he, he told me about, you know, they have this control center where they try to figure all this out. I would love to do something with the TVA for Smarter Every Day, but it's, it's fascinating. Well, in this particular situation, there uh, was, I think still is, a coal plant called the Kingston Fossil Plant in Kingston, Tennessee. And apparently, much like the situation you were talking about in Hungary, some kind of settling ponds or a series of settling ponds were key to their waste management process. So they're burning a type of coal here that is apparently ground very fine. Now, I don't think that's how all coal plants work, but everybody in this conversation who doesn't know much about coal plants, raise their hand. Me. <laughs> okay, it looks like, okay, well, I didn't think you would, but I definitely don't know what I'm talking about or how this works. The articles I read indicated that their process was one of a few different ways to process coal, and that if you process coal in this fashion, that you get this, this slurry that is a byproduct. You get something called coal fly ash. Okay. And... It's tough to nail down coal fly ash, as I understand it, as being one specific thing. It can exist in multiple states of matter, of cleaning, because it takes a series of separation ponds to get down to a pumpable liquid that you can get rid of, dispose of, clean, whatever, and to get down to something that could, I guess, be scooped and removed. I don't know what you do with the particulate matter that's left over after the settling process occurs. What do you call the leftovers there, the dredges, the the goop when the, the liquid's pumped out? The precipitate, maybe? I don't know. I have no idea. Ooh, that sounded good. That sounded real good. Yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds right to me. So what happened here was they were still using in December of 2008. What day? Uh, which was a Monday. It was a Monday. It's a Monday. Another Monday. It's another Monday. Okay. Oh, crazy. And I think it happened in the middle of the night, dude. Did it really? 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time really? on a Monday morning. Now, how? see, we thought we might see some patterns emerge. <laughs> okay. No. No, what am I doing? I'm taking partial credit for this. The day of the week thing was entirely you. It doesn't matter. It's you ours. You thought we can did, have did m patterns might emerge, and they have. You brilliant man, you. No, that's awesome. But brilliant though you may be, let me tell you what you don't have. What do I not have? A cherry turnover. Oh, uh, <laughs> you still have I that still. thing. It's so good from yesterday. I just can't get enough. It's so flaky, is the thing. They're flaky, and that's why they're delicious. Okay, so here's what happens. So December 22nd, 2008, they got these holding ponds. Now, they've known for like 50 years, dating back into the early 60s, that this method for dealing with the coal fly ash was not the best way to do it, and that it was uh, intrinsically damaging to whatever container was holding it. And so apparently for the previous eight years, maybe six years, they said, they'd been doing repairs on this thing constantly. Every year they were having to do repairs when it got cold in the winter. They were having to fix the thing up because the temperature changes, it looks like, contributed to some of the damage. Whoa. So... Locals had a problem with it. They had had concerns for some time. This wasn't a mystery, but I don't think anybody could have imagined what would happen if it actually just fully broke, which it finally did. One of these holding ponds would release about 4.2 million cubic meters. That's 1.1 billion gallons of this partially separated coal fly ash slurry. And what happened was there was about a one-minute flow where the same thing you described, the dam shows a little bit of weakness, and then boom, it just all goes. Wow. But then there were successive spills that happened after that as other parts of the dam gradually became compromised as well. And so you get this one-minute rush that took out a bunch of properties, and somehow nobody died. In that initial rush, Nobody three died. houses were, were destroyed, uninhabitable. 
something like 40 others were damaged so badly that I, I think they I think those houses ended up being restored to some degree of functionality. Blew out roads. It destroyed some utilities, gas lines. A bunch of people got evacuated, but apparently nobody even had to be hospitalized, even though this turned out to be, and now I'm just reading this to make sure I get this fact right, it turned out to be the largest industrial spill in the history of the United States. What? Three times larger than the Mar Martin County sludge spill of 2000, and significantly bigger, a hundred times larger than the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So this is an environmental disaster. It is a calamity is the point. So it sounds like this is one's going to have a happy ending because everybody got out and everybody was fine. Well, then people have to come in to clean it up. Do you watch that Chernobyl show on HBO? I haven't actually. I should, but I have not watched it. The initial explosion, real bad. But when they sent in the rescue crews that night to try to suppress the fire, which is real tough with a hose to put out you know, a, a nuclear meltdown, that's when the disaster started to really strike. So you had all these people in close proximity of the fallout and over the, the coming weeks and months, that's where you saw that death toll just skyrocket. Well, the same thing happens here. 40 deaths are attributed to people who came to work the cleanup and to investigate what went wrong. And I'm not sure I totally understand medically what that exposure did to people, but ultimately the determination was that the people in charge should have known what was going on with these holding ponds, that there'd been sufficient evidence to say this wasn't a good idea, it wasn't best practice for... Um, for a long time, and there's just. Kind I'm of just going to read a sentence here. Uh, the initial spill resulted in no injuries or deaths, but several of the employees of an engineering firm hired by TVA to clean up the spill developed illnesses, including brain cancer, lung cancer, and leukemia, Whoa. as a result of exposure to toxic coal ash. And by the 10 year anniversary of the spill, more than 30 had died. Um, Wow. So uh, the casualties thing on the Wikipedia page says 40 deaths and 250 plus illnesses related to cleanup. Wow. That's huge, man. Oh, just what a cruel double whammy that in the, you know, it's a horrible event and a, a lot of damage, but you kind of take this sigh of relief as a little community. And you're like, well, okay. I mean, we got a lot to clean up, but we're going to come together. We're going to get this done. I mean, this is a town of 6,000 people. And then you realize that it's an environmental disaster with a really lasting legacy that ends up taking a bunch of people's lives as well and just pretty dark stuff. Wow, you can see some aerial footage of the spill itself. That coal ash looks like a... It looks like... I don't know. It doesn't look like mud. It kind of looks like fluffy mud. I don't know, I don't know what it actually hmm. feels like, but it, it looks like water is what gives it its ability to flow. Obviously, that sounds dumb, but but... Huh, it's it's a weird stuff because it looks like it crumbles away. Um, do you know what slump factor is? Like, um, when when you pour concrete, slump factor, it, slump. Yeah, when you pour concrete, they have these little cones, and you take some of the concrete that you are pouring and you put it into the cone, and then you flip it over, and you see how much of the concrete slumps down. Like, you 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 take. Yeah take the cone off, and then you measure the height of the, the slumped concrete versus the height of the cone, and that gives you uh, something. I don't know. It's It has to do with the workability of the concrete. Interesting. So it's the same test that you get in the Dairy Queen drive through when you buy a blizzard, and they flip it over to be like, look, we could do that if we wanted to. It's just straight up upside down. It didn't come out. Yeah. That slump factor, right? K kinda. Yeah, that has to do with, yeah, how, how yes, ish. So... I'll take Basically, it. you just take a tape measure and then you you take your cone, put the concrete in it, flip it upside down, remove the cone, and then you measure how far down the concrete just kind of like bulges out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And okay. as I look at this coal fly ash stuff, it looks like it supports itself till it doesn't. Like you can see where it's kind of chipping away. Like if they had a big pile of it, it would be good. And then part of it would give way and it would all just start moving. 
Hmm. So it has some kind of structural integrity until a little part of it falls away and then it just all goes. So with your understanding of fluid dynamics, does that description that I was reciting to you, uh, does that fit with what you're observing looking at the coal fly ash itself, that you would have one initial rush yeah, and then sort of a bottleneck and that that would happen again? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It's it's kind of weird looking. It looks like it'd be very scary to approach. Like if you have yeah. a, I'm imagining a levee breaking and then all the material just stays up. Like half of the, the levee came down and it slumped down, but you've got like all the liquid that would have been in the big pond just kind of stays there until something hits it at the bottom and it's like a little mini avalanche over and over. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It sounds like the way an avalanche would behave, Yeah, not with white, pretty, pristine snow. Have you ever been in an avalanche? I haven't, no. They're terrifying. Have you? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a thing. Really? Uh, <clears throat> I've been close to some... Whoppers. I've seen legit avalanches in Wyoming and Colorado, and I've been in some cute little ones where it never got above my hips, Mm -hmm. which, I mean, if you're familiar with my stature, isn't really much of an achievement (laughs) for an avalanche anyway. But you're modest. It's crazy. Even just a, a mild little, we're just goofing around in the hills and something comes loose and there's just, there's just not that much snow to come loose. You're talking about maybe a a 30 or 40 foot little little run of snow before there's nothing above it. And maybe, you know, a couple times I've been hoofing it across there to go fish something I wanted to fish in the winter and just worked things loose. And it's like, all right, I'm not in any danger here. I can see the volume of snow that is available to come down upon me. But even that, it's really goofy how you just sort of surf in it until you don't. And all of a sudden... You're kind of locked in, and then uh, you move with it for a little while. It's it's a very strange thing, and it makes me better appreciate what it would be like to encounter something. I don't know if slump factor is the right term here, but something that has that it's holding together until it's not kind of factor, and then you get the full force of all of that potential energy at once. Uh, I could see how that'd be horrifying. Scary. That sounds scary. Okay, so that was the Kingston Coal Plant coal fly ash disaster. I have a taxonomical question for you at this point. Okay. Does an avalanche count as a non-water flood? I mean, it's water, but it's not water in its liquid state. What category does an avalanche get? Or or like a landslide? A landslide? I I guess it matters like the liquid content. Well, maybe not liquid content because I've got one coming up that's not liquid. So you mentioned pyroclast. Oh, I don't know the word. What is the word? Pyroclastic. Pyroclastic. Is there an L cloud? in it? Pyroclastic flow. Yeah. I mean, ask Galadriel from that Lord of the Rings show because she's more familiar with how to survive one of those than anyone. You just <laughs> stand right there and let it roll over you. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. That's how it works. If you're an important character. Let's go yeah. to the. Um, let's do Pompeii because you mentioned Pompeii, right? Yeah, pyroclastic. I just Googled that sucker. It's one of those words I always mumble out of because I'm afraid of it. Yeah. Remember, like somebody's name you don't know. What's up, Carolina Simil? Should Should we go Pompeii or should we go molasses? What, what should we do next? Well, more people died of Pompeii, I think, than died of the molasses flood. Let's go molasses. Okay, molasses it is. You're getting this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get this one. So uh, the I don't have any notes, but... But this came up in your college education, didn't it? Like... Weeks ago. So I'm studying for this oh. test, and I'm, I'm one of the tests that I was taking was about mechanical failure. And the professor, she, she's up there teaching, and she goes, oh, yeah. And then there's this, you know, this is why it's important to calculate stress concentrations on stuff like this. And she brings up the molasses flood in Boston, 1919. Is that right? 1919, January of 1919. What day was it? Great question. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Yeah, so she brings up the Great Molasses Flood, Boston, 1919, January 15th, 1919. There's this big vat of molasses that's being used uh, by this company called the Purity Distilling Company. Interestingly, didn't know this, molasses was used in World War I as a way to make alcohol, um, which was used in the production of bombs. And what? So, yeah, I didn't know that. So, huh. so here's the deal. Prohibition was just about to start. Like they had already voted in prohibition, 
And so this company is like, hey, we we don't make bombs anymore, but we have this process to make alcohol. Wow. And so uh, we've got about one year until prohibition comes into effect. So we need to make as much booze as possible. So this big vat that they had um, up, up in Boston on the north end, pretty close to the water, they were pumping molasses up into this vat. And um, they said they had they had pumped molasses into this thing many, many times. But as soon as this vat gets uh, installed uh, there in the town, everybody starts talking about it. They're like, hey, this thing is uh, leaking. Like that, look at it. It's, it's leaking. And the company's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, we'll just paint it molasses colored so you can't see so they <laughs> they used a, a camouflage technique to try to um kind of you know oh you can't see the leak so we're talking 2.3 million gallons of molasses in this thing now this is the interesting thing about the class i was taking so we talked about failure analysis and so when you have a tank like a pressure vessel you have two types of stress primarily you have axial stress which is um, like, let's say you have a uh, like a propane tank. Have you ever seen a propane tank outside somebody's house? So you've got this long. You mean like a big one? Yeah, like a big one, a horizontal. Yeah, I've, I've had one of those at a property before. Sure. Okay, so if you were to pressurize that thing with gas, like like you know air, and you were just keep pumping air in that, then there's two types of stresses that would happen. The first type of stress would try to blow the ends off the tank. That's called axial stress. All right. The second type of stress would try to rip the tank lengthwise, and that's called hoop stress. So if you were to take a, an air hose and you were to put it in your mouth and you were to pump your body up with air, your belt would blow off before the top of your head blew off. This is the way my professor said it. And so the, the hoop stress Gross. is is um, is higher than the axial stress. And so it's really interesting the way all this stuff works out. So when you look at a, a water tank up high on a mountain, you, you got other things happening, right? So like the cylindricalness of the tank wants to come apart. Like you, you think of, oh, well, that water is so heavy up there, it's just going to come crashing down because the legs won't be able to handle it. You think that's how it would break. But this is a little bit confusing because we're talking about a propane tank. Those are usually long like a sausage or a Tootsie Roll. Okay, so stand it upright. But yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. We got to rotate this 90 degrees yep. for this molasses fat. Okay, got it. So in this case, the hoop vulnerability, yep, is running horizontally, exactly around it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So typically, when you look at stuff like this, when engineers make a tank or something like that, they think about the hoop stress and the axial stress and stuff like that. My question for this tank is, what happened at the bottom corner? Like, is the bottom of this tank rounded? Like, is, is it spherical or is it just like a 90-degree a angle? Because if it's a 90-degree angle, then that's definitely where it's going to fail. So I have a question. Yes, Hold sir. on. I'm trying to picture this myself. I've always pictured this molasses vat being like a, a barrel, which is ridiculous. Like, surely it was not the shape of a barrel. But when you think about old-timey things that hold confections and sweet sugary things, you just picture a barrel because of laziness. But is it possible that this is more like one of those holding tanks you see from the mid-century in small-town America that is effectively just a circular container with a domed top? I mean, it seems to me that that would be the most logical structure to contain this volume of molasses as opposed to something more like a barrel shape where it's rounded or it tucks in. There's actually the photos of it. So I don't know if you've ever been oh. going, you know, when you take off in an airplane, you can see where they keep the fuel at the airport. They're usually really big cylinders of steel. They're just cylindrical vessels of steel. Yeah, but not like a silo on a farm. It's something fatter and shorter. Great way to describe it. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Yes. So I, We're talking about the same thing. Yep. So it was one of those. I think it was actually up in the air. I don't know that to be true, but I, I hear people talking about it being over. So I think it was actually off the ground. That may not be true. It may have been on the ground. If I was an engineer that was doing this, I would definitely want it on the ground. But So maybe picture one of those little water containment, like like wood stilted short water towers that you see on the roofs of buildings in old depictions of New York or the Warner Brothers water tower that you see in Animaniacs 
just slightly elevated off the ground, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. The, the okay. important thing is that it was made of steel. Okay. And um, they think the way it ripped is uh, people reported hearing sounds like a machine gun firing, like da 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 mm. like that. And mm-hmm. that would be the rivets ripping apart because back in the day, they were still in the early days of metallurgy, and they were trying to understand how to put things together. You can't just, like now, there's a welder in the garage here. I can just go weld things, but that that's a whole art. Welding is a skilled trade. It's very difficult to do, but they didn't understand other things, like what makes metal brittle versus, uh, you know, there's, like, there's a whole field about what is martensite, what is austenite. These are different types of steel. Well, later, after analyzing what happened after the fact, they found that this particular type of steel didn't have the correct level of manganese in the steel, which ended up making the steel more brittle. In my class, when the professor pulled this information up, she actually put it on the board when we were learning about stress concentrations, and she said, we think at this point in time that the great molasses flood in Boston happened because of stress concentrations around a porthole due to the, how it was riveted together. So you heat up these rivets back in the day. You've, you know you have a bucking bar on the backside, and you bang these rivets together, and you can kind of sandwich two plates together. Well, I mean, that's, that's going to seal, but not perfectly, right? But you heated up the rivets to do all this stuff, and you're adding stress as you're banging these things together. And so there was a stress concentration at that porthole, and that's where they think it failed. Now, they reported that they had filled this tank up four times almost to complete capacity, but this was the first time they'd ever gone all the way and filled it up, which means the pressure in the bottom of the tank sure. would be way higher, Sure. and it just gave way. And uh, what happened after the fact was deadly. What day of the week? Did we figure out what day of the week this happened on? Wednesday. It happened on a Wednesday, okay? And this was yep. January 15, theory, 1990. Blown. Wednesday. Yeah. But the problem was it was in the middle of the day, right? Yeah, not 1 a.m. So with this one, you just get this bizarre rolling avalanche of sweet sludge that is both freaky at first, but then a curiosity, which is part of the problem. What do you mean? Well, as I understand it, the fact that people didn't recognize the threat immediately is part of what went wrong. You have no context for how you would move in something like that. And so it sounds like the urgency throughout the spill wasn't the same as it would have been if it had been a fiery explosion or a wall of water rolling toward you. You can sort of conceptualize that. This is a scenario that nobody who was strolling around downtown Boston at the time had really considered. Yeah. One of the things that I read about is like horses actually drowned in the molasses. Yeah. And so it it sounded funny and and newspapers all over the country picked it up but it was a, it was a tragedy like people got stuck people tried to save other people and they mm-hmm. they ended up dying themselves so there was like actual heroes in the middle of all this and um it, it was just awful so the sticky mess was everywhere i think it was 21 people died um they said 150 people were injured at least one person got swept out into um is is it the harbor there is that where they are or is it just Well, yeah, didn't it just flow out into Boston Harbor eventually? No, actually it didn't. They they tried to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, I read a thing where they were talking about all the different techniques they were trying to use to get rid of it. They tried water for fire hydrants. They couldn't get that to work. They tried burning it in times. They tried shovels. They tried to just break it up when it started getting hard. But it, it never gets completely hard, which is kind of the problem, because you can't just break it and put it in a wheelbarrow. It's like always this imagine dipping a honey dipper into a big kitty sized swimming pool of honey and trying to load that into a wheelbarrow because of the viscosity your shovel's going to be like coated it's just a nightmare and the honey is cold yeah super what this was january right oh awful yeah. that's awful and so it was a fireman that eventually said, hey, why don't we pump the water from Boston Harbor up into – is the harbor – I don't know Boston very well, but I think it is uh, Boston Harbor. They, they pumped the water from Boston Harbor up into the molasses, and something about the salt 
in the water ended up diluting and uh, kind of thinning it out enough where they could just kind of push it out into the harbor. But the thing that's really crazy to think about is you had basements. You know, whole buildings were just taken away off their foundations. Mm -hmm. Like a, a fire station was just demolished. Imagine having your entire basement, if you have a basement, filled with molasses. What what do you do? That is a problem. Yeah, I got no plan. You know that my basement flooded with actual water a few times in Wyoming when I lived there. I lived at the top of a hill, and for whatever reason, we had this bizarre little bit of underwater ground pressure that plagued my yard. A local there I was talking to was like, oh, yeah, I know where you live. We all used to ride bikes up to the top of that hill when we were kids back in the 1950s, and there was a spring up there. I was like, wait, like right at the top of the hill? Yeah, right at the top of the... Dang it. Stupid thing. So my basement <laughs> kept flooding all the time. And I just think about what a pain in the butt it was to move water out of my basement again and again. But all of the pump option goes away immediately when you have something as viscous as molasses or even approaching molasses. Uh, you got gravity working against you. You're kind of done. It's just bricked. I, I don't know. Burn it? Cover it over with concrete and move on? What do you do? It's a problem. I listened to a podcast uh, that interviewed an author. That I, Just to, to reference my sources here, the podcast was The Great Boston Molasses Flood by History This Week. I think it's put on by the History Channel, maybe. And uh, there's an author that was interviewed named Stephen Puglio, and, and he said one of the major factors uh, that contributed to this happening was the fact that this particular area of Boston was just super, super dense with Italian immigrants who at the time didn't speak a lot of English. And so people were like, oh, yeah, the molasses is leaking out of the vat. Not a big deal. And, and so people knew it was happening, and they knew the integrity of the tank was not good, but they kind of turned a blind eye to it. They didn't really care. Yes, the the firm that created the tank, they were reputable. They had made it made many other tanks in the past, but... As soon as they put this on, I mean, there were reports of kids, and this is why I think the tank was elevated. There were reports of kids using pails to collect m molasses under the tank as it was drip out. Hmm. And so just this big thing where people didn't really care, and maybe it had something to do with you know, the lower-class immigrant population of the neighborhood. Maybe. I don't know. But another thing that uh, Mr. Puglio pointed out in the podcast I listened to was that the results of this event changed engineering forever in, in this country, or at least now, modern engineering standards. So a professional engineer, when they design something, they have to put their stamp on it. And now they become responsible for the results of their engineering design, and they, they become culpable if something happens and, and something breaks and there's victims from a tragedy of something they stamped. So this whole infrastructure of accountability is set up as a result of the Great Boston Molasses Flood of 1919, which is interesting. And I know you have opinions about that. You don't like more government regulation. But I think it's very interesting that a lot of these things that we're talking about, like the coal fly ash, you know, they, they knew there was an issue. The In Hungary, um, the, the standards of the, the levees or, you know, the, the earthenworks dams around these things – they started losing integrity, and there were people in charge of that. So are these people at fault? Um, you know, in some cases, there there doesn't seem to be anyone that knew the thing was about to happen. But what are your thoughts on that? Going all the way back to Persia and Rome, there are unique consequences for engineers who screw things up. This is not a new concept in the West, and I do consider Persia to be part of the West. It's, well, a mingling of West and East. There were some stunning and unique consequences. If you built something and that something failed, and you know I want to have a conversation about clever, maniacal, ancient torture and execution methods someday, so I'll save it <laughs> for that conversation. Now, let me just clarify my position here. So for me, public morality starts with person and property. You own you. You own the things that your past work enabled you to buy and apprehend. So where government is one solution for protecting that, I like it when it protects person and property. 
if we have a shared ethic of you own your body and you own your stuff and I own my body and I own my stuff, and that's where the law flows out of, then it doesn't matter if I'm a Muslim, a Buddhist, an atheist, a Christian, whatever, if we both agree that regardless of your opinions, beliefs, orientations, whatever, you own you, you can make a pretty robust standard of laws out of that. I don't think that cell phone charger tips rises to the level of protecting person and property. That, to me, looks like it gets into more things that the free market could solve or ways to enrich politicians, lobbyists, business people. So I just want to make that distinction between the two things. Let me put it this way. The sloppy mismanagement of that tank because of its physical proximity to other people was an aggression against the person and property of all of the neighbors who shared that. If somebody goes and dumps a bunch of coal fly ash into a river, well, that's an aggression against all of your neighbors and everyone who is downstream from that. I think it's perfectly reasonable for society to come together and say, those are abuses we just won't tolerate, and those are risks that like, we want to say in. We want to be able to speak to whether or not your stupid tank will do what it's going to do. So thank you for indulging me that tiny little aside. But wait, what was your original question? I got all excited about <laughs> about public morality and ridiculous political philosophy. No, no, no. I, th I think you answered it. I, 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 th I think you answered it like someone should be held responsible for this. Yeah. I'm of two minds because I'm I'm actually scared of getting what's called a PE license. So I just recently took this big hard test and my mind is pretty sharp on you know how to do these calculations right now and so I'm considering going to take the PE exam. I don't know what that is. What is PE? Professional engineer. So if if you mm. pass the PE exam then you can stamp drawings that says, "Hey, this person is knowledgeable in the art of designing beams for houses. This person is knowledgeable in the art of sizing pumps or whatever it is that you get your license for. What happens if you stamp something and it doesn't work? What's the penalty? It depends on the the consequences of, but yeah, you're held responsible for your design. Criminally liable or civilly liable? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's criminal. See, that's, that's a very important distinction. Criminal liability, I think, could only be established, I, I'm spitballing here, in situations like what we're talking about with this tank or a modern version of that. If you had clearly been instructed by some societal oversight board to say that is dangerous and needs to be resolved immediately and you intentionally obfuscated or refused to do something about it, there may be criminal liability there. There maybe should be criminal liability there. But generally, civil liability is what I would expect, that you could be sued for money, not put in jail. I know this. I know molasses flows downhill. <laughs> and so if if you were to uh, do some type of PE certification and you were to work for an engineering firm right now and you were to design a tank and it were to fail, yes, the company that hired the firm to create the tank, they're going to sue the firm, right? What I don't know is if yeah. the firm is going to sue the employee that actually did the thing. I, I don't know how that works. But what's interesting is, is a lot of these concepts came about because of this molasses flood, which I think is fascinating. So, I don't know. I, Indeed it, it is. And that came about because of the pressures that the temperance movement put on people who made molasses. So it's overzealous I mean, religious people that made all this happen. I mean, it's... it's I mean, well, Honestly, the temperance <laughs> movement... Oh, holy cow, man. We, I think it'd be great to do a whole thing on the temperance movement. But, I mean, think about it. You have a bunch of people like... Carrie Nation, Billy Sunday. Carrie Nation was a prohibitionist who went around and smashed up actual saloons with an axe, like just some lady who'd be like, alcohol is so bad and destructive. She'd go and wreck people's stuff. And, and this got political momentum after abolition was more or less taken care of. Then like you kind of have, everybody needs a cause. There's always a cause du jour. There's always a current thing. Some of those current things are more worthy than others. Abolition certainly being one of the more worthy. But the whole temperance thing, alcohol got real cheap because of industrialization that we're talking about here. And alcohol went from being a thing that people didn't have the patience to ferment and cure all the way out to its full potency. So they were drinking stuff that usually wasn't incredibly 
powerful and they could only afford so much, but public water supplies in the late industrial age were a disaster. So it was actually better to drink cheap alcohol as a substitute in the minds of many for the garbage water that was being provided publicly. And as a result, domestic abuse skyrockets, prison populations skyrockets. You get all these problems in the late 19th century that then caused religious people and social progressives and odd alliance to partner together to say, we got to stop this thing. And all of that brings us back to the point where they passed some legislation, well, not some legislation, a full-blown constitutional amendment that stood for 13 years, the only one that's ever been repealed, fully repealed. And, and that puts all kinds of pressure on people who've been in business making booze for a century or two. And what are they going to do? Just shut everything down or try to pivot? Well, they try to pivot. You got different benchmarks that you have to hit. You have new production means that you have to hit. And as a result, some corners get cut, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, a whole bunch of molasses floods everything and horses drown in there. That's crazy, man. Yeah, we should do a it's whole... It's just all interconnected. That's the point. I, I would love to have a a discussion with you about alcohol sometime because I, I can attest from, you know, personal experience family wise that it's, it's destructive in nature. But I think, yeah, we should just talk about that. Cause I think that would be an interesting discussion. So yeah. I think it would be too. Okay. We'll table it. Thank you for indulging me briefly. Molasses flood of 1919 happened on a Wednesday. I've got one more big thing. But do you have anything else we need to discuss before we go? And I, we certainly haven't covered all the non-water floods in history. But, uh, I mean, do you want to talk Pompeii or what? Yeah, and this is interesting. I'm, I'm seeing some new taxonomy or clarification on our taxonomy evolving as we're going along in our discussion here. An avalanche, I mean, it's snow, it's water, it's a water flood, but it's different. It's so different in terms of viscosity that it doesn't act like a water flood. A mudslide is so different in viscosity that it, you can't rightly call it a flood, but it kind of acts like a flood. I think I know what your final example is going to be. That's natural and not man-made as well. Certainly a volcanic eruption and a pyroclastic flow, that's not man-made, but it's kind of it behaves like a flood. So it would seem like you got two different categories here. Well, three, you've got your traditional water flood. Then you've got your other things that happen in nature that are flood-like, but are made of a different substance or, or water in a different state of matter. And then you've got your man-made stuff where the actual flood medium is something that people crafted, be it oil or sludge or slurry or waste or fruit juice or molasses or chocolate or whatever it might be. So I'm always excited when the categories take on a little bit more clarity, and I, I think we're gradually achieving that here. That makes me a little less enthusiastic to talk about the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, but the quick version, and I think we do need this one to be quick because I want to get to your last one, is just 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius blew up and it buried a couple of towns, the famous town. Oh, wait, wait, wait. what, that it what was the date? I, I, we, surely we know the actual date of this. Uh, it's somewhere in the fall. I don't think we actually know the date. We have to know the date. <sighs> what day did... I think it's just the fall. August 24th, 79. That's a date. What? Yeah. So, August? I don't think that's right. You don't think so? No, I think it happened later in the year. I, okay, I'm going to go look. I'm, I'm on the computer right now. Uh, Mount. Because it's a Tuesday. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. I've got. I gotta know. I gotta know. Okay, here we go. Historians have long believed that Mount Vesuvius erupted on 24th of August, 79 A.D., destroying the nearby Roman city of Pompeii. But now an inscription has been uncovered, dated to mid-October. Almost two months later, you can't have an inscription in Pompeii two months after the volcanic eruption that buried the entire city. How can so, we not know that? Like he was like a whole city just gone. How can we not know when that happened? Yeah, and it's kind of crazy too because one of the greatest historians in antiquity, Pliny the Younger, was there. And another famous historian, 
Pliny the Elder died in that eruption. Really? Yeah. Uh, so you think he would be like, hey, my... Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah, and he did. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, this is really fun. Yes, Pliny the Younger specifically said on the 24th of August, about one in the afternoon, my mother desired him to observe a cloud. And then he goes into the description of what he saw as an eyewitness. I, I'm looking at a BBC article. I'm skimming it. The Pliny the Younger was... He was in a ship out at sea, and I think Pliny the Elder died trying to shuttle people back and forth out of Pompeii uh, and the neighboring community. I, I, it's another one of these names that I always mumble because I'm a little afraid to say it, but Herculaneum, wow. I think is the name of the other town that got destroyed there. So I think we have to say there is ambiguity as to the actual date of the Pompeii eruption okay. at this point. Okay, sounds good. I'm calling it Tuesday. So let, it happened on a Tuesday. Don't okay. I win? <laughs> Let's go. But one in the afternoon, Pliny was probably right about that. Have you been to Pompeii? No, it's like I, I want to go so bad. I've I've asked my wife if uh, we can splurge for our 20th wedding anniversary and go, um, but I don't, I don't know if it'll happen, but I, I really want to. That would be fantastic. Yeah. It's a neat, sobering stop. You know how you got these things that happen from time to time in life, I mean, funerals being the obvious one, but things that just force you to stop and think about mortality. Yes. Maybe it's a certain type of movie that you watch, a book, a story, a song, whatever. When the leaves come off in the fall, heck, that'll do it. I don't think I've ever had a more poignant encounter with the passage of time and my own mortality than my visits to Pompeii, particularly the first one. There's this one section called Garden of the Fugitives, and I think people who haven't been there before imagine that all of Pompeii is like this because it's the image you always see, but it's a family lined up trying to retreat, and you can look at the size and body proportions of the people who are entombed in ash in the moment they died, and you can see like, okay, that's the dad. Oh, he realized the family couldn't keep up, and he's turning back to try to help, but he can't get any further. And, oh, that's the mom, and that's the kids, and the grandparents, they went down first. Wow. You can see what the flight looked like, and you can reestablish in your brain how quick this thing would have hit. So it happened that instantaneously. Yeah, people survived. People got out, and my understanding is that the flow... The wall of ash wasn't evenly distributed over everything. The excavation depths were different. The ash assembled and stacked up at different rates. Some people saw it coming and chose to go. Some people saw it coming and thought, well, that wouldn't get here. That's a long ways away. And it is a long ways away. When you stand there and look up at the mountain, you're like, dang, that, that had to cover a lot of ground really fast to catch people in these particular poses, to catch a dog in that particular pose. That's crazy how fast that must have hit. 20,000 people lived in those cities. We have no idea how many people died, but according to this article, pretty well-known statistic, uh, 1,500 bodies or negatives where the bodies would have been have been discovered at this point, and wow. they're not even fully excavated at all. So, I mean, it could be that a vast majority of people died. I remember seeing a weekly reader when I was a kid that kind of had uh, an estimate of the population. I think it was the same estimate, around 20,000 between the two towns. And it had a lower number at that point because they were earlier in the excavation process, which has been going on for 150, pushing 200 years. And they said maybe a 1,000 people died because that's how many bodies had been discovered. Well, that's not even close to the total death count there. And it's possible pretty much everybody died, save... A few witnesses. I'm seeing one thing here uh, that says 1,500 to 3,500, possibly up to 16,000. Oh, there we go. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot. In terms of a flood event, it has some of the same anatomy in terms of the human psychology and the response, right? Did you see the avalanche video? I feel like maybe we shared it back and forth on Twitter. The avalanche video that was circulating here a while back where the guy is just filming some vertical video. He's like, look at this avalanche far, far away. And it comes and like then, right up to him. Yeah. Yeah. He has to duck behind a big rock. And you're like, dang, dude, that's getting really close. Wow, I can't believe how far that's. You need to take cover immediately. And you go from neat to, 
oh crap, the guy with the camera is going to die in what, 10 seconds? Right. It's, it's unbelievable how fast it's coming at him. Yeah. And now imagine instead of ice death that theoretically you might be able to get on top of and swim out of like they coach you to do in an avalanche. There's no escaping this, despite, again, the portrayal of Galadriel in the Rings of Power. There's no escaping this. If you're caught up in this, you have no air to breathe. Everything is choked out and gone. You're going to get one lung full of this stuff, and you're going to fall to the ground, and you're going to be overcome with heat. And then this partially liquid, kind of heavy, odd, floating volcanic ash is going to pile up on top of you, compress over time, and there you are, entombed for all of eternity, just like that. This one has it's always captured my imagination since that weekly reader in Miss MacMahon's third grade class. I've just always been kind of mortified by this account. I, I think it counts. I think this counts as a flood because of the way it happened. It, it's not necessarily liquid, but, I mean, flow... <laughs> Py- pyroclastic flow um, and it just comes over you. I think it's a crazy thing, man. So, uh, man, that's awful. That's awful. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by the patrons, the people who support this program at patreon.com slash no dumb questions. You don't have to do that because it's free, but you do. And that's awesome. And it's not just Destin and I who are grateful, but our wives, our kids, It's the stabilizing force that makes this thing long-term make sense. Don't get me wrong. We could not be more grateful to the sponsors who support the program and kick in in the way that they do. And we're so grateful to everybody who's responded to those sponsorships. But you who are most invested in this thing and support it, you're the heartbeat of it. You're the reason that the podcast ultimately exists, that the conversation keeps going on. And it's important to us that you understand that a ton. Now let's go back to fumblingly trying to thread the needle between having a laugh about ridiculous sounding floods and also being very serious because it actually had consequences. Thanks again. I have one more thing to talk about. Okay. That I think is very, very interesting. This is something I've, I'm only recently, I've only recently learned about. They're called the Death Lakes in Africa. Have you, have you heard of this? No. I mean, you tipped your hand a little bit about this topic. <laughs> So I went and flirted with it and then backed way off because I just wanted to learn it from you and it seems super interesting. But no, I did not know about this prior to just before we jumped on mics here. Okay, so there is this phenomenon that happens in certain lakes in the world. Um, Recently, there's a a lake in Cameroon in Africa. Have you ever been to Cameroon? I have. Yeah, I've been into Yaoundé a few times. Tell me about Cameroon. I've never been there. Um. It's a developing world nation. It sits right in, like, not the metaphorical armpit, but kind of the armpit, the bend, the undertuck of Africa on its west coast. It borders Nigeria. Nigeria is to its north and west, and Equatorial Guinea is to its south, divided by a a big river there. I've been uh, on both sides of that river. Yaoundé is not... uh, gorgeous city. It kind of has that look of mid-century Western money trying to prop up a cooperative government. And uh, I once got stuck on the runway there. Somebody hit a plane with a baggage cart. I've told you about this before. And we all got escorted off of the plane into a holding cell while they figured out whether it was some kind of attack or plot. In Cameroon, this happened to you? Yeah. What? Old, old, rusty AK 47s. I think it was in Yaoundé. No, uh, it was in Douala, Cameroon. Yeah, it was Douala. And we were on our way to uh, Nigeria, eventually to Paris. And they took us all into this holding cell. People from around different countries in Africa, uh, Cameroon citizens, a bunch of American doctors were on the flight. And they they put us all in there. No bathroom, no nothing. Dudes in dark green camouflage with their AKs at the door. Metal over the windows. No bathrooms or anything. Didn't tell us how long we'd be there. No food, nothing. Pretty soon people started having to go to the bathroom. And so folks would make like human shelters in the corner for men and women to 
use one corner that we designated as a bathroom. What? Yep. And nobody, I mean, we just had no idea what was going to happen. And then without any explanation, they just came back in. They're like, okay. And just made a row so we wouldn't leave the tunnel. Row of guards with their, I don't know if they had like little berets. It was that kind of look. And they got their AKs and we just had to walk between them. We got back in our seats and very quickly took off. And then once we were out of Cameroonian airspace, the Air France captain or somebody came on and was like, hey, uh, a baggage car hit the plane. The plane is fine. It was a, I mean, it was light contact. Somebody from the ground crew made a mistake. They panicked and, you know, we were wildly late to Paris. They put us up. I ended up staying in Paris for an extra day or so as a result. So yeah, I got some, I got some Cameroon stories is the point. I've been around there a little bit. This is a, okay. The, the question I'm about to ask you is very juvenile, but like, okay, just everybody, did they just number one in the corner or were there some number two? That had to happen in the corner. Uh, I didn't go check the corner, man. It didn't smell good. Okay. Like, I didn't go over and inspect. Like, ma'am, are you done? I just wanted to see what you left. <laughs> there. Oh, wow. Oh, mercy. Like, I didn't realize I served corn on the cob on this flight. I didn't go over there at all. Like, I'm not going to go inspect that. But it smelled real bad, man. Dude, that is so bizarre to go from like, hey, we're just all, check us out. Whoa, we are <laughs> like at like base level body. <laughs> Let's keep our bodies alive level very quickly. So... Sounds yes. like you don't have great memories from Cameroon. Uh, it was fine. The other times I was there, it was just real bad passing through that one night. Oh, wow. That is wild, man. Okay, so um, there is a lake in Cameroon called Lake Nios, uh, N-Y-O-S. Lake and, Nios. What part of the country is it in? I'm going to look it up. I, I think it's in the north. I'm not really sure. Okay. Not really up on my uh, camera. I, I've just, <laughs> all of my research has focused on this one lake. I don't know anything about okay. where it is or context or anything. All right. But if you look up the Lake Nios disaster, I am going to call this a flood. Okay. And the reason I'm going to call this a flood, there, there used to be this little experiment we would do in chemistry class where we would take you know, something like vinegar and bacon, just bacon soda, and we put it together and it would like erupt and make, you know, a little volcano thing, but it made carbon dioxide. And you could capture the carbon dioxide. And then if you had like a candle, you could get a cup of carbon dioxide and you could pour the carbon dioxide out on the candle and you could extinguish the candle. Have you ever seen this simple demonstration? No, I have not. So, I so carbon dioxide is heavier than air. So you can contain okay, that. I knew. Yeah. Okay. So you can contain it in a cup, and because okay. of buoyancy, buoyant forces, you can take that carbon dioxide and just pour it out on the table, and you can't see it, but you can imagine that it would flood over the table in front of you. A huh. uh, quick note: Northwest Cameroon, close to the Nigerian border. Got it. Got it. So there's this thing that happened. Well, one, one other thing: carbon dioxide is also um, you, you've drank soft drinks before and you've got that sure. that fizzy taste or that it, it's almost like a burn have you have you felt that burn of yeah when you sure, of course. burp up carbon dioxide or whatever we used to use uh, on the range sometimes we would condition the rounds before we would fire them the rockets we we would say hey we need to we need to test this one at minus 40 degrees fahrenheit so one of the ways we would get it that cold is we would use carbon dioxide um, and we would chill the rounds. And so we had this little box. Just imagine something probably about the same size as the holding cell you guys were in. Um, Im imagine a small room, and you would just run uh, CO2 through there, super, super cold. Like the, you know, you'd use liquid CO2 to just chill. Is that what's in the thing that I use to spray electronics and like the little spray cans that dust off a keyboard or something? I don't know what that is. That's probably some type of propellant, but I, I don't know. But um, what we would do is we always had to worry about asphyxiation hazards hmm. when we would get to the missiles. We'd say, hey, um, the crew, you guys need to go get the cold rocket. And you'd open this door, and all this carbon dioxide would come flooding out onto the ground around you. And it was so incredibly cold, but it would also, if you breathed it in, it would just burn really really bad but it's just co2 so there's not a like a poison hazard or anything like that but there is an asphy asphyxiation hazard yeah it just isn't oxygen correct but it does burn or and, and consumable that's, oxygen right and so that's you you immediately know what's going on because it hurts okay 
So uh, on Thursday, August 21st, 1986, there was something that occurred in Lake Nyos called a Limnic eruption. That's L-I-M-N-I-C. Lemnic eruption. Okay. So this lake in Cameroon has a very high concentration of carbon dioxide in the bottom of the lake. Because it's always hot in Cameroon, you know, typically you've got a you you've got hot air rises, right? And hot water will rise. And and you've been scuba diving or you've been snorkeling and you felt the thermocline. When you go under the water, you kind of bust through this layer and you can get down to the cold water. You've felt that before. Yeah, and I've seen the way trout behave as water temperature changes at different depth than a, a mountain lake. Right. Well, in Cameroon, there's a like a perfect storm of uh, geology and temperature gradients and all the things. There's a volcano nearby, and carbon dioxide is being fed through the the volcanic rock at the bottom of this lake. And there's this huge buildup of carbon dioxide at the bottom of the lake, and it's contained there in like a super saturation. Every once in a while, it will all just instantly boil off. It's maybe not boil off is maybe not the term, but it, it comes out of saturation. And you have this gigantic eruption, is the word, of the lake. And it just spews out carbon dioxide. I'm talking an incredible amount of carbon dioxide. And on the 21st of August, 1980... just like a, a bubble, like a belch? Yeah. Yeah. The gas comes out of saturation. You know how when you open, it's like opening a, a Coca-Cola. And if you open it and it's under tremendous pressure, you've seen somebody shake up a, a, a Coke or a Dr. Pepper or something like that. Sure. You open it and it'll spew everywhere, right? Right. That is carbon dioxide in saturation in a liquid. That's what that is. Hmm. So imagine an entire lake that has Whoa. a super saturation of carbon dioxide in it. And something happens. I don't know what it is, but something triggers the, you know, you've seen the the Mentos and Diet Coke experiment, and the Mentos is the thing that triggers the, re, you know, the release of the carbon dioxide. Yeah. Imagine that, but an entire lake. And now imagine a village next to that lake where people live. And the amount of carbon dioxide that could be saturated in a lake and because carbon dioxide is heavier than air, just like you can pour out the carbon dioxide over a candle, that happens at the lake. So, boom, all of a sudden, all the carbon dioxide comes up from the water, and it just does what? It floods right next to the shoreline. It floods over the lake itself. It floods right next to the shoreline. And, and runs downhill. Yeah. Yeah, this is a 3,600-foot high lake in terms of elevation, so it's got a lot of drop. A lot of opportunity for that to run. 1,746 people died on this day. Oh and 3,500 livestock, sheep, cows, things like that. All of these people and animals asphyxiated. I know from pulling rockets out of conditioning boxes that one of the last things they felt would have been a burning sensation in their, in their mm. mouth and lungs. It's awful. But this is a thing... That happens, and th there's a, only a few places that it's known. To, there's three lakes over in that area. One of them is Lake Nyos, where this happened. There's another one nearby in Cameroon called Lake Manoun, M-O-N-O-U-N. I mean, th this is a known phenomenon that happens. And so what they're doing is they're trying to figure out how to get the carbon dioxide out of saturation. So this is a gigantic tragedy can you imagine uh do we know what time this happened i don't know i'm looking that up now it's in the middle of the night in the middle of the night so a lot of people would have died in their sleep uh yeah there's a first-hand account of somebody who woke up while it was happening it's horrible dude really horrible yeah i'm gonna read it this is sad if people want to skip a minute ahead i get it this is sad do it there's a survivor named Joseph Nequain from Saboom, one of the villages. And he said, I could not speak. I became unconscious. I could not open my mouth because then I smelled something terrible. I heard my daughter snoring in a terrible way. Very abnormal. When crossing to my daughter's bed, I collapsed and fell. I was there till nine o'clock in the morning of Friday the next day. 
until a friend of mine came and knocked at my door. I was surprised to see that my trousers were red, had some stains like honey. I saw some starchy mess on my body. My arms had some wounds. I don't really know how I got those wounds. I opened the door. I wanted to speak. My breath would not come out. My daughter was already dead. I went into my daughter's bed, thinking that she was still sleeping. I slept then till it was 4.30 in the afternoon on Friday that same day. Then I managed to go over to my neighbor's houses. They were all dead. I decided to leave because most of my family was in Womb, uh, another village, I guess. I got my motorcycle. A friend whose father had died left with me. As I rode through Nios, I didn't see any sign of any living thing. When I got to Womb, I was unable to walk, even to talk. My body was completely weak. Golly, man. That's Can you imagine that? You go to bed. You wake up and you can't function. It's just nothing's right. Air's not right. Your body's not right. You can't talk. You struggle to get breath. The first thing you're going to want to go do is check on your daughter. And you can't make your way all the way across the room. It takes two bouts of sleep to make it from your bed over to your daughter's bed. And when you get there, she's gone. I mean, this is such a matter-of-fact description of the events, but the emotion behind it is really easy to imagine. It's awful, man. It's awful. I would categorize this as a flood because it yeah. it just totally engulfs everything. Imagine that, man. That many people just died. You know, many did not wake up. So I don't know if it felt like hypoxia, which I've experienced, which is a lack of oxygen in the brain. I don't know what it would have felt like, but it's you know 1,746 people died. That's amazing. Pivoting slightly, you started to talk about what they're doing to try to prevent something like this in the future. Yeah. How does that work? How do you combat something that's happening so deep underwater, something that's so natural? Well, what's crazy is these events don't happen often. Like, they happen so sparingly. The period between the times that this happens is longer than a human lifespan. So you may have heard of the Hunger Stones, Um You've yeah. heard of hunger stones where they're like, hey, if the water level ever gets below this stone, start crying because, you know, there's there's not going to be, you know, your famine is coming or stuff like that. And Japan, you've you've seen stones that says, do not build your house below this stone because a tsunami could get you. Mm-hmm. And so there are efforts from previous generations to try to warn those in the future that may not even, you know, know that the previous generation existed. And that's the kind of event that a limnic eruption is because it takes so long for the carbon dioxide to build up in the water that you just don't know. And so um, they have some attempts. They're using engineering methods to degas. They've got pumps that they're using to try to get the carbon dioxide up. I mean, it sounds silly, but when I drink um, tea, I drink half and half tea. I mix my tea up. And that's, that's a discussion we need to have with Dalen at another time. He and I have opinions about that. But one thing I do is if I get sweet tea in the bottom of my my cup and you take your first drink of tea with a straw, it's all sweet. and That's not what you want. You want it to be mixed up. And so one thing I do is I'll blow bubbles to try to, you know, kind of like you would oxygenate a pond, right? You want to flip the water. And you've explained to me how a pond can flip and all the carbon dioxide just comes out of the pond instantly and it kills all the fish in the pond. That's why oxygenating the water is important. So there are some efforts to you know, have pumps where they have tubes down and pipes down to the bottom of the, of the pond, or the, it's, a, it's a lake, excuse me, to try to flip the water. It's not natural, huh. but it's a really, really difficult thing. And there's a volcanic element to this too, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's we the, don't know what the relationship is, but just looking at it here, it looks like these lakes are somehow related to this, this weird little chain of volcanic activity I didn't know existed that just runs right up through the corner of Africa looks like it runs right there in that little spot between Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon and Nigeria and on up a ways into the continent at a 45 degree angle running southwest to northeast. Looks like all of these death lakes are in proximity of a volcano, but it also looks like nobody knows exactly how the volcano is contributing to this buildup. That's my quick summary of what I'm seeing. So interestingly, this is a thing that happened we know it happens. We can try to prevent it in the future. That's a tragedy, right? And we, we should try to prevent that in the future, which brings me to 
what I would propose we end the episode on, because we, as you decided to arrange this fantastic topic, thank you so much for coming up with this topic, dude. This was... Thanks for playing ball. Yeah, brilliant. So you decided to order this in order of tragedy, okay? How many people died? I have one in the future that we need to think about. There is another one of these death lakes in Rwanda. It's called Lake Mm. Kivu, K-I-V-U. Okay. Lake Kivu is another one of these death lakes. It's even worse than Lake Nyos because not only does it have carbon dioxide and saturation at the bottom of the lake, it also has methane. Oh. So you can literally Google videos of Lake Kivu burning, and it happens. Like, you can see people in this village right there on the side of Lake Kivu, and it's, like, on fire. And you're like, what? Are you serious? Yes, the lake is actually on fire. It's insane. So this has got to sit right on that East African rift. It has to be what's fueling it, right? It's it's right on the border with, with Congo. And um, okay. so here's the thing. Two million people live on the shores of this lake. Whoa. It is so much bigger than Lake Nyos. It is incredibly large. Two Sixth, million. The largest lake in Africa. Just like just looked it up. Is it really? 2,700 kilometers squared. Okay. so That's a time bomb. So I, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but what I, what I am saying is people are worried about it because it has the same physical properties as Lake Nyos. This Lake Nyos disaster happened in 1986, right? It doesn't happen often enough where we're like, oh, yeah, let's don't build there you're trying to settle an area you walk up you're like man it's a gigantic body of water obviously this is where i'm going to put my village right well sure they've done some core samples at the bottom of lake kivu which is very deep by the way and uh at its maximum depth it's over 1500 feet deep they have found in the strata several different mass extinction events that have happened at the lake whoa so they don't know when it happens it happens on the order of thousands of years and period. But the problem is it's settled now. There are millions of people that live on the banks of Lake Kivu. In fact, there is a a company, they're like, okay, this is a problem. And there's a company that now generates power from the methane. I think it's the, it's called Kivu Watt, K-I-V-U-W-A-T-T. And so they, there's a company that has pipes going down to the bottom of the lake and somehow they separate out the methane from the water, like just straight up from the water in the lake. They separate it out, and then they generate power using the methane. But my question is, wow, is Lake Kivu at risk of having a massive desaturation event, so to speak, basically the lake burping, and we have a huge, like absolutely huge flood of carbon dioxide, and this time methane again, and this time it, it could kill millions of people in Rwanda. That's my question. I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I know that I'm concerned about it. And people are thinking about it and clearly workshopping solutions. And if one of the solutions provides power to an economically depressed part of the world while reducing the likelihood of a cataclysmic event, I got to say, Hey, bravo to your field. Good job, engineers. That's amazing. You said earlier that Lake Kivu was one. You you did not say it was the largest lake. You said it was one of the largest lakes in Africa, right? Sixth. Sixth? Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, this is a, this was an interesting topic, dude. I I appreciate you taking me down this rabbit hole. I kind of want to go to Lake Kivu and check it out. I kind of do too. Yeah. It's kind of like talking about war though, right? And let me put a bow on it this way. This is how I think about it. Talking about war is really interesting. The history of warfare, what people used, each technological advance to get ahead of the last person. I mean, heck, we play video games about it. This is basically the plot of civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're learning about like uh, flight and philosophy and stuff. But ultimately, that game comes down to, yeah, but what weapon can I stab people with next? Warfare is very dark. It guts societies. It's incredibly expensive. It is not sexy. 
it is one of the really unfortunate expressions of what it is to be human and live on this planet. We just cannot seem to get this right. We get worked up and we kill people. It's a huge problem. Also, it's fascinating to think about not just the battlefield mechanics and all of that. It's fascinating to think about the psychology of that. What would it be like to be engaged in ancient Persian Greek style warfare where you just got a mass of people, a flood of humans coming at you with eight and 10 foot spears covered by shields? And well, your betters have decided we're going to handle that with archery and they are moving inside our arc of fire. Uh, They're getting real close, guys. I can't even shoot arrows at them now at this range. I don't have an angle. What's the plan here? What's the plan? I mean, the psychological pressure of that moment that these historical oddball outlier, non-typical floods, and I would include even ancient battlefield tactics in that, the, the psychological aspect of that, it takes you to a whole new place in terms of the human experience that's very difficult to empathize with because it is so entirely foreign. And once you get past the joke and the fun of like, <laughs> beer went everywhere because <laughs> beer people drink it and get drunk is so funny. Once you get past that and into what you would do if you saw a wall of beer coming at you while you were mourning the recent death of your two-year-old child, I, I don't know. It takes you to kind of the outer limits of what it is to be a person and to be a person who's in constant battle with a physical environment that ultimately wants to kill you and ultimately is going to win. For me, there's there's hope in that we can learn lessons. And, and so I think that as an engineer, the fact that we now know more about the manganese content and steel and how it's important to get that right and also make the, the wall thickness of your vats thicker um, because of these things, we, we can learn the lesson. But unfortunately, someone had to learn the lesson and a lot of those rules are written in blood or in this case, you know, suffocation. So I think learning the lessons from the past and trying to figure out how to improve on them and reduce human suffering moving forward, there's not a Hippocratic oath in engineering. I wish there was something similar, similar that was like, you know, Hey, you know, I'm going to do things to help people. I think the reason there's not a Hippocratic oath in my field is because engineers make wars happen. (laughs) So, and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, myself included, right? So I think it's interesting to think about all the lessons that we can learn here and and try to make things better for future generations. And I did not expect that when you had me research things about non-water floods. I thought I was going to joke about sticky molasses stuck in your basement, but uh, it took me to weird places and I really appreciate the topic. Yeah, I appreciate your optimistic note. I agree. And I think anytime we experience human empathy, that's just a win, even if it's human empathy over dark stories and difficult things, because that's part of the human experience too. Lots of lessons to be learned about what to do and how to manage things, but also lots of things to explore in knowing ourselves and knowing the people we love and how we're wired and how we face down the, the really big stuff. So thanks for doing a weird episode with me, man. And thanks for putting in a ton of work too. I know you did did your homework and that made it uh, all that much more fun. It was a great topic. Thanks for thinking about it.